Hi, my name is Ivan Pedrosa, and I am a radiologist at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. First, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to this meeting. I have been charged with covering the role of imaging in localized advanced renal carcinoma, and more specifically, in the assessment of nodal involvement and tumor thrombus. These are my disclosures. Locally advanced kidney cancer refers to the regional extension of tumor beyond the renal capsule. This occurs in three ways. First, direct extension into the fat that surrounds the kidney. Second, through the renal vein and into the fear vena cava. And third, to the regional lymph nodes. In this talk, I will be discussing the last two mechanisms. So let's start reviewing the lymphatic spread. The kidneys drain first through the lymph nodes in the renal hilum, and from there to the lymph nodes around the aorta and if you're gonna cava. The studies performed in patients with kidney cancer using lymphocentigraphy and SPECT imaging to detect the sentinel lymph node intraoperatively confirmed that for most tumors, the sentinel lymph node is indeed in these locations. And here you can see the same color for the primary tumor and the sentinel lymph node. The frequency of metastasis of lymph nodes in kidney cancer is not entirely clear, but probably occurs in about 5% of T1 and T2 tumors. We know, however, the positivity rate increases with the number of lymph nodes resected, reaching about 10% when 13 or more lymph nodes are removed at surgery. Patients with lymphatic metastasis have a higher risk of disease recurrence, although the resection does not improve the cancer-specific mortality. Computer tomography, or CT, is the most common imaging modality for staging renal cancer. A lymph node with a short axis diameter greater than one centimeter is the size considered as abnormal. We also look for other features like a rounded shape as opposed to oval, irregular margins, or lack of enhancement in the presence of necrosis. The main challenge of imaging is the detection of micrometastasis, however. If the lymph node is not enlarged, then we can rarely make the diagnosis. Here you have an example of a young male with translocation renal sarcosinoma in whom a good quality CT exam only show a five millimeter regional lymph node with completely normal appearance. However, after surgery, pathology revealed micrometastasis in two out of nine lymph nodes. Overall, CT has a mo modest sensitivity and a specificity of 76 and 79% respectively. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is being used more commonly for staging renal tumors, and the criteria is the same as for CT, size greater than one centimeter in short axis. Again, we can also appreciate suspicious morphologic features and necrosis. However, MRI has the same challenges as CT. We miss micrometastasis. Although some of the reported sensitivity and specificity looks a lot better for MRI than for CT, I will argue that this is based on all literature and relatively small series. Large studies with current technology are necessary to assess CT and MRI diagnostic performance. Missing micrometastasis is not the only challenge with cross-sectional imaging. In this study, in 163 patients evaluated with CT prior to surgery, 43 patients had lymph node enlargement, and of those, 42% of them had metastasis of pathology only. In the other 58%, the enlargement was secondary to reactive hyperplasia, and this happened more often in patients with renal vein, tumor thrombus, and in those with necrosis in the primary tumor. The studies assessing the role of positive emission tomography or PET imaging with FDG in metastatic renal cell carcinoma have reported inconsistent tracer uptake leading to high false negative rates. Also, the spatial resolution of PET is low, so the detection of micrometastasis is challenging as well. And indeed, the reported sensitivity and specificity is only about 75 to 87 percent, although the reported specificity is excellent. One can also target the CA9 cell surface protein that is expressed in over 95 percent of clear cell carcinomas with iodine-124 during tuximab PET-CT. In this trial, the sensitivity and specificity to predict clear cell histology in primary renal tumors were 86 percent, although lymph nodes were not evaluated. A different approach is also targeting the CA9 protein with zirconium-89 label gerentuximab. Here they compare the detection rate of metastatic lesions greater than one centimeter and lymph nodes greater than 1.5 centimeters using contrast enhanced CT alone versus FDG PET CT plus contrast enhanced CT and zirconium-89 gerentuximab PET CT plus contrast enhanced CT. They did this in 42 patients with metastatic clear cell carcinoma. 
Overall, the authors found that the combination of zirconium 89 urantuximab and contrast-enhanced CT in red in this graph was superior to the other approaches. However, when they looked specifically at lymph nodes, the combination of FTG PET plus contrast-enhanced CT was actually more sensitive. In any event, it is not entirely clear how PET CT would perform in the assessment of lymph nodes during the staging of primary tumors because this was done in the setting of metastatic disease. To summarize the literature on lymph node assessment in the staging of locally advanced primary tumors, we do not have currently a definitive imaging test that offers high degree of diagnostic accuracy. So let's move now to the assessment of tumor thrombus. Renal cell carcinoma has a predilection for extending outside the kidney via the venous system. It has been reported that up to 23% of renal cancers develop tumor thrombus in the renal vein. 10% reach the inferior vena cava, or IVC, and 1% reach the right atrium of the heart. In the TNM staging system, tumors with renal vein thrombus receive a T3A. Tumors with thrombus reaching the inferior vena cava below the diaphragm receive a T3B. And tumors with thrombus above the diaphragm or invading the wall of the inferior vena cava receive a TC3. And this approach is supported by prospective data indicating that tumors with higher stage tumor thrombus do carry a worse prognosis. Because this information is also used to plan surgery, an alternative approach known as the Mayo classification, the Mayo clinic classification, is also widely used. This classification defines level zero as thrombus limited to the renal vein, level one as thrombus in the IBC but no more than two centimeters above the renal vein ostium, level two as thrombus in the IBC more than two centimeters above the renal vein but below the hepatic veins, Level three as thrombus above the hepatic veins, but below the diaphragm. And level four as tumor above the diaphragm, which includes those entering the right atrium in the heart. Therefore, recognizing the distal thrombus with respect to this three anatomic structure, the renal vein, the hepatic veins, and the diaphragm is critical because these are major surgeries with substantial perioperative mortality. In fact, at 10% compared to 0.1% of nephrectomies in general. Level three and four tumor thrombus may require vascular bypass, so on occasion dedicated cardiac imaging with echo or MRI may be necessary. But in general, CT and MRI are sufficient and the most common use techniques to assess tumor thrombus in the IVC. Here you can appreciate an example of a level zero with the distal renal vein being patent without thrombus. This is a level one thrombus with the distal tip just entering into the IVC and the IVC is widely patent above the thrombus. This is a level two thrombus where the distal tip is more than two centimeters above the renal vein, which is marked in yellow, but below the hepatic veins, which are marked in pink. This is a level three thrombus where the distal tip is just at the level of the hepatic veins, marked again in pink. And finally, this is a level four thrombus extending above the diaphragm, which I marked here with a white arrow, and the tumor is just entering into the right atrium. And as you can see, these five examples using MRI, there is exquisite delineation of the thrombus and its distal level. So a common question is if MRI is needed today after a good quality contrast enhanced CT. These two prospective studies compare CT and MRI showing excellent performance for both and concluding that current contrast enhanced CT is similar to that of MRI for determining the level of the tumor thrombus. A couple of important points, however, First, both studies use a multi-phase CT acquisition with three phases in one and four phases in the other. So don't, don't expect that a single phase CT will do the job. Second, they're relatively small studies with 23 patients and 11 patients each. Regardless, with adequate technique, contrast enhanced CT can demonstrate well thrombus in the IVC in most patients, as you can appreciate in this particular patient with level th four thrombus above above the diaphragm. In some cases, however, I think the MRI is helpful to confirm or clarify the findings, even when using state-of-the-art contrast enhanced CT with multiphasic acquisitions, particularly in complex cases where we may end up doing both CT and MRI examinations, like in this patient with bilateral renal masses. The cortical medullary phase on CT shows hyperenhancing tumor thrombus in the right renal vein, marked in red. The left renal vein in yellow is patent. Coronal reconstruction during the nephrotic phase 
confirms the thrombus in the right renal vein, but does not show thrombus in the IVC in blue. Contrast enhanced MRI shows again the right vein tumor thrombus, but these coronal titubated images obtained without contrast show very clearly that the renal vein thrombus enters into the intrahepatic, sorry, infrahepatic IVC. The rest of the IVC above and below the renal vein, as well as the left renal vein, are widely painted. Another important distinction is the presence of tumor thrombus versus blind thrombus, since the presence of blood thrombus may indicate the need for anticoagulation. Tumor thrombus tends to have heterogeneous signal, although the main differentiating factor is that it enhances after administration of contrast because it is vascularized tumor tissue. Blind thrombus, on the other hand, tends to be homogeneous and it does not enhance with contrast. Most of the time, Blunt thrombus occurs inferior to the tumor thrombus because of the slow flow or complete occlusion of the IVC in the abdomen by tumor thrombus, but not always. In these patients, you can appreciate a level one enhancing tumor thrombus just entering into the IVC with non-enhancing blunt thrombus in yellow, both above and below the tumor thrombus, and the infra infrarenal IVC is painted. This other patient, also with level one enhancing tumor thrombus, has also only non-enhancing blunt thrombus below the tumor thrombus. Again, the more distal infrarenal IVC is patent. This third patient had a level three enhancing thrombus. The IVC, the tumor thrombus was widely patent. However, the most inferior IVC and the iliac veins were completely occluded by non-enhancing bland thrombus. So this information needs to be clearly detailed in the report so that the treating physician can decide on the need for anticoagulation. An emerging role of imaging is the prediction of venous wall invasion, where some thrombus, like this one, are clearly separated from the wall of the IVC. Others make the wall of the IVC imperceptible. And this qualitative assessment has been reported to have moderate to excellent sensitivity and excellent specificity to rule out wall invasion. An alternative approach is to use quantitative measurements. The largest study today included 172 patients with thrombus level two to four out of 394 nephrectomies with tumor thrombus. They included both CT and MRI and used the need for IVC resection and reconstruction at surgery as a surrogate of tumor invasion. At multivariate analysis, they found that right-sided tumors, an anteroposterior diameter of the IVC greater than 24 millimeters, and radiological complete occlusion of the IVC at the level of the renal veins were increased with a three to four higher risk of IVC reconstruction during the nephrectomy. Another important consideration in patients with IVC thrombus is the development of boot chiari syndrome, which is caused by blockage of the hepatic venous outflow by the thrombus extending above the level of the hepatic veins. Clinical presentation includes abdominal pain, ascites, hepatomegaly, and liver failure. However, it is not uncommon for this complication to go unnoticed and for imaging to be the first clue to the diagnosis. This is relevant because boot carry carries a very high perioperative mortality. In the study of 162 patients with level three and level four thrombus, there were major complications in over a third of patients and 90 day mortality was almost 11%. Boot carry was diagnosed in 8% of patients, but it was tabulated as unknown in almost 40% of them. At univariate analysis, unknown boot carry was associated with substantial risk of death. At multivariate analysis, boot carry did not remain significant. However, an abnormal living function test, AST, was associated with almost four times higher risk of death. When should we inform the possibility of boot chiari? When an imaging study demonstrates ascites, not explained by other causes, and vascular compromise in the liver. This patient with a large infiltrative left, left renal mass has a large level four thrombus marked by red arrows and ascites shown here in blue. After contrast administration, there is a heterogeneous enhancement of the thrombus and heterogeneous enhancement of the liver, of the right liver, and more the late post contrast images show occlusion of the right hepatic vein by blind thrombus, whereas the middle and left hepatic veins are widely patent. And liver function tests confirm both Chiari syndrome in this patient. So, in conclusion, detection of lymphatic metastasis in locally advanced renal cell carcinoma is challenging we miss micrometastasis and have false positives due to enlargement 
caused by reactive hyperplasia. Assessment of the person of tumor thrombus is excellent with both CT and MRI. CT is probably sufficient in most cases, although MRI is very helpful in challenging patients. MRI is likely superior to CT in the characterization of tumor versus plant thrombus. Quantitative assessment of the likelihood of IVC wall invasion and the need for reconstructive surgery is helpful. And imaging offers clues to the diagnosis of Budd-Chiari syndrome and possibly higher preoperative morbidity and mortality and should be paid attention to. Thank you very much for your attention.